Hi, everybody. Welcome once again to Grace to All with Paul Gray. And this is our second edition of uh, being together uh, with my friend, Dr. Boyd Purcell. And uh, I call him a friend because we are friends. We just haven't been friends for very long because uh, today's really the, the second time that we've talked together uh, in person or not in person, but uh, uh, via uh, the Internet. And uh, but I feel like I know him because I, I've been reading and studying his books and uh, hearing stories about his life and his kids and his grandkids and his background and different things for quite a while. So welcome back, Dr. Boyd Purcell. Thank you, Paul. It's good to be back. Thank you. And I won't give your uh, introduction again because uh, I know people heard it last week or uh, they're going to be so excited by hearing you today that if they didn't hear last week, they'll go back and listen or maybe listen again. And uh, we were, we've been talking about some different things about uh, uh, hell and, and about the uh, uh, oh, Luke 15, uh, the uh, uh, at least my understanding of Jesus clearest teaching on hell was where the elder brother was. Uh, uh, in his mind, and uh, you, at least the only time I've ever heard it, is the term called elder brotheritis that I heard from you. So if you would, uh, just go ahead and tell us about the words that were used for hell, uh, why they were uh, mistranslated, and, and what we need to know about that today. Well, those are really good questions, and uh, why they were translated as they are with the King James, and the King James is probably the best read Bible, and sometimes the only Bible read by Christopher Mendelist. And I was given a King James version of the Bible at age 12, his birthday present, and told to only and forever use the King James. <laughs> because in the last days, they, although they never said who they were, but they will change the Bible. So many people believe that, they're growing up on that, and they won't even read another Bible. Uh, it may be a uh, her heresy that they're reading instead of the true gospel that King James translated. And like people know, King James is not a good evangelical Christian, except <laughs> evangelicals are good Christians. But he was the king of England, as people probably know. But he was only interested in one thing, that was holding on to his power and having absolute control over people. He had absolute control of life and death over people, in order of execution, whatever. So his mother was uh, Bloody Mary. Queen of Scots, and she killed people who disagreed with her. That's why she had the name Bloody Mary. So uh, King James did the same. So he was not interested in people's spiritual life and translating the King James. He wanted to have one version of the Bible that be read throughout the whole uh, British Empire, and that's what he got for a long time. And uh, so, uh, for whatever reason, they chose to indiscriminately translate three words, Greek words. Uh, the one is Gehenna. One is Hades, and the other is Sheol, that's a Hebrew word in the Old Testament, uh, as hell. Now, most modern translations either translate those words as Gehenna, Hades, or uh, Sheol, or if they use hell, and sometimes they still retain hell for Gehenna and translate Hades and Sheol, uh, literally, in Greek or Hebrew. But uh, if they uh, do use uh, hell, then they may give a footnote to say what the actual word is in Hebrew or in Greek. King James did use that. And then there's one other one uh, in Peter, he talks about uh, Jesus descending down to the lower parts of the earth. And the word is used there is Tartarus. Now Tartarus was one of seven levels of Hades. And Tartarus was actually the lowest level of Hades where the worst people went. And when Jesus descended into Hades, hell, he didn't stop at the first or second or third level. He went all the way down to, to, Tar to Taurus and led captivity captive. So he destroyed it in that sense. And then Jesus himself said in Matthew 16, 18, I'll build my church in the gates of Hades, hell, shall not prevail against it. Now that's many people the question. Uh, what was Jesus talking about here, and what's on the offense and what's on the defense? Is hell or the church on the defense? And almost everyone says, including the clergy, well, hell is on the offense, church is on the defense. And we could say, like Martin Luther's great song, a mighty fortress is our God, a bulwark never failing, our helper, he amid the flood, mortal ills prevailing. So a mighty fortress is our God. 
or church is a mighty fortress. Well, that's not what Jesus is saying. He said, I'll build my church and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. So this is a war metaphor. In the ancient world, uh, every city of any single size had a wall built around it, high and wide. And when any enemy army approached, they would close the gates. They always had gates to close and barricade. And uh, then they would defend themselves against the enemy. So for an army to take a large city, they would need to besiege it for months, sometimes years, or even a decade or longer to be able to weaken it enough to bring in the battering ram, ram down the gates. Exactly what Jesus was saying, the gates of hell, not the gates of the church, but the gates of Hades shall not prevail against the church as a battering ram. And when people have seen that, they say, oh my goodness, I never saw that before. That changes everything. <laughs> it does. Uh, that that phrase you just used, I, I've used in, in uh, my books that I've written, that changes everything and uh guys when when we see <laughs> when we see the truth that was right before our eyes that even that we'd read many times in scripture and we I, i'm getting goosebumps as i just talk about this when, when we see the truth well that changes everything doesn't it and there's uh there's at least for me there's no going back once the holy spirit has revealed something to you uh has shown you the truth of what really is um, all the, uh, all the, uh, academics, uh, uh, in the world can't convince you of something differently because you've, you've experienced that you've heard it from God and, uh, you know, it's true. You have that. I can't remember what the Greek word is, but, uh, uh, assurance, um, uh, I can't, it, you have that confident assurance that it's true. And, uh, it seems like, if we're open to that, we keep getting more revelation of that every day. Well, yes, we live up to the truth we have, we'll receive more light from the Holy Spirit. Yeah. If people reject the light they have, then they probably won't get more. Yeah, yeah. So uh, summarize, you, you did a little summary of, of your uh, tulips with an S on it. Uh, you also changed a little bit of the, uh, some of the wording of the, uh, the actual tulip. Uh, would you mind taking the time and going through that and just to share that with folks? Sure, I'll be glad to do that. Um, I first used the tulip, and this is a traditional Calvinistic tulip. I did not come up with this. This was in the 17th century. Uh, early you 16th. weren't around then? <laughs> <laughs> but uh, they, uh, Arminius was a theologian, it was uh, after Calvin, and he came up with his uh, Arminianism which I've said the basic focus of Arminianism is on God's uh, free will, while Calvinism is focused on God's sovereignty. Now, briefly with the tulip, uh, T-U-L-I-P, the T stands for total depravity. Now that's pretty negative to begin with, that man is so totally depraved that we cannot even reason properly. We can't even ask God for forgiveness of our sins unless God grants us the ability to ask for forgiveness. I took Dr. D. James Kennedy's uh, Inventions of Explosion course. And of course, he's a five-point Calvinist. And before you pray somebody, if you talk with the person and they realize they're a sinner, they're ready to pray, they ask that God to forgive them and accept Christ in their heart. And you just say, well, wait a minute. Let me pray for you, for God to grant you repentance so you'll be able to pray the right kind of prayer and mean it so you can get, be saved. Although you're already saved because you're actually in the elect if you end up getting saved. So it's crazy, but uh, anyway, the U stands for unconditional election, but it's only unconditional election for a few, not for everyone. And then the L is limited atonement, but again, only for the elect, not for everyone. And irresistible grace is the I, and that's only for the few elect. So if you're in the elect, everything's really great. Yeah. Uh, because with the, the perseverance of the same means you cannot lose your salvation. Whatever you do, you can live like the devil, and still be saved and not lose your salvation if you are in the elect. But with the quickly, the opposite of that, the Arminian position is with, with the T, they believe in partial depravity, not total depravity. Uh, so all are capable of believing theoretically, but few are still going to believe. And then the U for unconditional election is conditional election. Uh, you are elected by believing. 
and then the L is uh, for a limited atonement is unlimited atonement, but still to your say. Irresistible grace becomes resistible grace, which may be resisted forever. And with perseverance of the saints, no, uh, salvation is not assured and you can lose your salvation. Now with the rewording of that for the tool up, not only do I put an S on the tool, but I recharacterize each one of the letters. For example, total depravity becomes total love. Paul, isn't it better to emphasize God's grace and God's love, unconditional, all-inclusive, everlasting love, total love rather than total depravity of man? Because uh, God's all-inclusive, unconditional, everlasting love saves all. So with the U, unconditional election, it's for all or the helpers to save all. Now, the great uh, theologian, George MacDonald, He's also written a lot of books, maybe 50 or more. Uh, he said that the helpers, the, the elect, are God's helpers whom God has sovereignly chosen to help bring about the salvation of all people. So I don't know whether everyone's elect or if there's some people elect, but if so, it's only to bring about the salvation of all people. So it's a very positive thing either way. And then L is for the Lamb of God, not limited atonement, the Lamb of God who does what? He takes away the sin of the world. And notice it's not the sins of the world, the singular, the sin, the collective sin of the world that the Lamb of God, the Lord Jesus Christ, takes away. Isn't that a beautiful thing? When John looked and saw Jesus coming to him and he said, behold, yeah. the Lamb of God, who yeah. takes away the sin of the world. And then, well, Let me just stop you for a minute. If, if Jesus took away the sin of the world, then what would we be punished for? Well, we, we won't be. <laughs> and in fact, something even deeper here is everyone is already saved. Yes. Well, you have to get out there and try to get people saved before it's eternally too late. And God yeah. will love them in hell forever. Yeah. But on the cross, when Jesus said, it is finished, when the plan of salvation was complete for all time, past, present, and future. So uh, as some great theologian has said, the great German Swiss theologian, uh, Karl Barth, said that, Salvation Christianity today, evangelism, is not getting people saved, but announcing the good news to them that they have been saved. Yeah. So they can enjoy their salvation and share that good news with others. Exactly. Yeah. Sorry for interrupting you there. Oh, no I couldn't contain myself. <laughs> well, uh, it's a lot to be excited about. The yeah. I in the tulip redefined is infinite grace, mercy, patience. That was slashed between two of those infinite grace, mercy, patience of God is why God will not and cannot ever fail. Because I've said this isn't rocket science as far as getting people saved. God only has to do two things in order to win the cosmic war between good and evil and save every person without violating anyone's free will. Those two things are, number one, is love unconditionally. And number two, is be patient. God is eternal. Mm -hmm. God is in a big hurry to go someplace. God isn't going anywhere. Yeah. His patience endures forever. Well, we're told that, in fact, in uh, 1 Corinthians, the 13th chapter, the love chapter, yeah. we're told some things about God's love, and God is love. So it says that agape is God's divine love, that it is patient. The very first thing Paul said, yeah. agape is patient. So yeah. that's, as, that's what we need to know about God. Sure. not give up on anyone. No, also, no it also says he keeps no record of wrongs. Absolutely. <laughs> and he does not insist on his own way. And God believes all things. He endures all things. He hopes all yeah. things. And yeah. love never fails. And if love doesn't fail, God doesn't fail. And right. therefore, God will not fail to destroy evil and reconcile the cosmos to God's loving self. Seems so simple, doesn't it? It is. And so it's been, been so messed up and so confused. And really, well, we have a lot of atheist agnostics because people say that doesn't make sense. And I, one person read my book, Spiritual Terrorism, who uh, works for Native Life Care in West Virginia. And he is an atheist by profession. And he read the book and he wrote a five star review for it, posted on Amazon and said, even atheists will like this book. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, when atheists told me they don't believe in God, I said, well, that's okay. God believes in you. Yeah. And then you, you like me, call God Papa uh, for the. Uh, in the last letter of P, which right. I think Jesus came to reveal that God is a good Papa. 
Right. So Jesus, who spoke Aramaic, called God Abba, which means Papa, very loving, affectionate term. And so rather than personal science with this tool, I have Papa God. Our loving Heavenly Father will surely become all in all. What does that mean? In 1 Corinthians 15, we're told that first of all, this 22nd verse, that as all died in Adam, all will live in Christ. That's a perfect parallel. And then Jesus will live a kingdom up to God when he has drawn all to himself, according to John 12, 32. And that God may be all in all. And I like the translation yeah. of that in the Revised Standard Version. It says, that God may be everything to everyone. Yeah. Concept. Yeah. I, I'll never forget, uh, boy, the first time I explained that to uh, someone very near and dear to me who is a five-point Calvinist. And they said, well, yes, but we know all doesn't mean all. all right. And I've... <laughs> I mean, and I, of course, I've heard that since then, and I'm just going, oh, man. <laughs> right. well, all means all, according to the Bible, in uh, Romans 3.23, all of sin and fall short of the glory of God. Yeah. But when it says that all of sin, that, that's 100%. But when, and I say, well, what about all dying Adam? Is that 100%? Oh, yes, that's 100%. But all live in Christ? No, nah, that's maybe only 10% or less. Yeah. No, and of course, Romans 3.24, which is never quoted, is... All have been made righteous. <laughs> right. Or so, Romans, Romans 5.18. Yeah. That one man's rights, uh, condemnation, uh, uh, unrighteous condemnation come upon all men. And by yeah. one man's righteousness, the Lord Jesus Christ, there is salvation for all people. Yeah. Oh, it seems, it uh, just seems so, uh, so clear. And it is clear, but uh, it really that's a true gospel. So one last thing that the S on the tool, as I mentioned, is symbolic fire, salt and sulfur, put a slice between each of those. Those are mixed metaphors that uh, symbolize disinfection, healing, and purifying from sin. So how much clearer could that be? Yeah. And the whole understanding of sulfur, uh, which you write about so well, was was used for purifying and uh, for cleansing in a number of different ways, uh, medicinally, uh, uh, in Jesus' day and age, and uh, uh, it still is. Uh, it, it's, uh, it's, it's not what we were taught it, it uh, was. Well, again, we go back to King James, which says fire and brimstone, like Revelation 20, Revelation. And so I've asked people again, you know, pastors, uh, clergy, other clergy, and lay people, uh, you've heard the like brimstone, and I've shared this many times with hospice patients who are elderly pay people that tried being Christian their whole life, they still afraid they're going to hell, they're going to get burned out like a fire and brimstone forever, and I said, well, you know what the word brimstone means? Not one time did anybody know what brimstone meant, from hundreds of people, and this includes clergy, and I said, well, uh, according to Webster's Dictionary, and I had to look this up about the time of 45 when I finally figured this out. And I looked in my uh, Webster's Dictionary and it said that brimstone is an archaic or outdated word for sulfur. And I thought, wow. And then I thought about, well, what would that symbolize? And then I went to my Bible dictionary and found out what sulfur is known for in the ancient world. And it was known for its uh, disinfection properties, its fumigation properties. If someone had died of, in a home of infectious disease, they burned sulfur to disinfect the house. They lice mice, other vermin, they burn sulfur to disinfest the house. Uh, they use sulfur to suffer the produce, to preserve it, to kill bacteria. And when I shared this with um, my mother, uh, she's 75 years old at the time. And she had said she didn't know what to believe. And I come to share it, leave the universe of salvation. But uh, she, uh, I told her about brimstone named sulfur because she'd not heard that. And she said, well, that makes sense to me. I said, well, really, Mom, what does that make sense to you? And she said, well, I she remember helping her dad, my grandfather, sulfur apples when she's a young girl. And I said, well, Mom, I never heard of sulfuring apples. Have you heard of sulfuring apples, Paul? No. Okay, no. I learned something here. So she said uh, that you do that to preserve. So that, wouldn't that leave an awful aftertaste? I remember it in a high school chemistry class. I bet burning sulfur smelled. No wonder it's a fumigant because it smells really bad. Uh, so she said, no, uh, she said, you do it, you sulfur the apples to kill the plant uh, disease, bacteria, and so on, to preserve them. You slice up the apples, and then you put them in a big pot, and you scallop out a place in the center, and you set it in a sulfur pot. 
and you have to get out of the building, you set the sulfur pot ablaze, ignite it, and they get out of the outbuilding because you'll get fumigated if you don't. But uh, she said that it doesn't leave a bad aftertaste. In fact, she said the apples are delicious and you can preserve them all winter that way. And she said that makes perfect sense as far as the spiritual application of a lake of burning sulfur. And, wow. I, and very interestingly, the word for sulfur is theon, the identical word for divine. So this is a divine lake of purification. Yeah, I, and I, I, I know I've read that uh, you've written about that. Oh man, I, I, uh, you know, thinking about the King James and fire and and brimstone. The, uh, I, I remember uh, arguing uh, w with somebody one time, <laughs> and uh, fortunately, the more I understand about grace, the less uh, argumentative I, I get. <laughs> but, but uh, you know, we were, I, and and uh, I said, what well, you know, haven't have you never studied the Greek? Do you not know what these words mean? And the person said. I don't care about the Greek. All I care about is the King James. And if it, if it says, and I, I'm going, well, how do, how do I argue with that? And the Lord was sort of saying to me with a twinkle in his eye, I think, <laughs> don't argue, Paul. I, you know, well, leave 30 the years ago, I received a call from the evangelical pastor. He wanted me to contribute to a fund to translate the King James Version uh, from English into uh, in Russian. And I said, why? I knew why he was talking about it because the King James is the only infallible translation of the Bible. They're talking about King James people who actually believe it's an infallible translation. And I said, you realize what a mess that would be? You always <laughs> want to go from the target language into the language you translate from. And that'd be the target language the one you're translating from, or, or two. And um, he said, uh, no, uh, the, the King James is an infallible translation, so it would make a good deal. And I said, well, the King James was translated first into Greek to Latin, and then Latin to uh, to uh, the King James English. And then, then you go from King James into Russian. I said, that'd be a terrible mess of people, but obviously I didn't contribute to the project. <laughs> but I was a heretic because I yeah. I, I read something the other day that said, uh, um, can you can you imagine the uh, the head of a country like the United States uh, hiring seventy uh, Bible translators and paying them to translate the Bible the way you wanted it to be, and then calling it infallible? Right. Well, that's what King James did. <laughs> it is, and the translators right. are very concerned about not uh, offending the king. Yeah, yeah. Regarded them as translators, or even had them executed. <laughs> yeah. Oh gosh. Well, our our time is up again, uh, Doctor Purcell. I uh, hopefully you have time to do one more uh, short uh, interview, and, and sure. we'll sign off today, and then we'll finish uh, uh, some things up uh, with some more questions that I have for you. And uh, this this has been again so good for me, and I know it is for our listeners. And so. Uh, before uh, we finish again, to tell people where they can get your books and how they can connect with you. Well, the books Spiritual Terrorism and uh, Christianity Without Understanding are on Amazon. You can read the reviews there and see what people say. And some people say that their life has been transformed by having read one or both books. And then uh, you could get them uh, at other uh, online sellers or at local books. Perhaps you can order them for you if uh, you choose to do so. And then you can also email me at uh, dr. Doctor, dr. Dot Boyd Purcell at gmail.com. And I'll be glad to send information, things we've talked about, acrostics and other things I've developed, number of documents that I think are very instructive and very liberating and uh, good news that people would like to have and to share. Well, they, they are instructive and liberating, and I, I thank you for being accessible and being willing to, to share those with people. I, I've been uh, uh, accused uh, and accused, accused uh, in lieu of other people, uh, too, saying, well, you guys that teach grace, you just do it for the money. <laughs> I'm thinking, oh, if you only knew. And uh, the, the, the people that I know that know 
grace and unconditional love uh, are more willing to give their things away. <laughs> it's cost me a lot more than I've made than I'm sharing the good news. It's cost me dearly. Yeah, me too. Probably at least a quarter million dollars in lost income, uh, forced retirement, or at least the re resignation and yeah. struggling to survive financially. Yeah, I, I, I can relate. I can. Well, We'll we'll close on a happy note in that uh, this is good news. It's good news for all. And uh, as you mentioned uh, earlier, that uh, George McDonald said, uh, we have the privilege of being able to share that uh, with other people and tell them the good news. So, and uh, we'll do some more uh, when people, you and I, will stay on the line. But uh, people will hear the next interview a week later, and uh, I know they'll all be looking forward to that, as I will too. So thanks again for being with us. So you're welcome. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, for being with us for another edition of Grace to All with Paul Gray. We'll see you next week.